Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, this week we'll be looking at verses 13 through 15. This is the second part of what we started last week, spiritual transformation through the supremacy of Christ. Spiritual transformation through the supremacy of Christ. Colossians chapter 2. As we consider how Christ has now been exalted as supreme, we recognize that there was a prerogative Prerogative by the forces of darkness that was launched back in the very beginning. This prerogative to overthrow the good purposes of God on this earth, to dismantle what God was creating, and to distort the image bearers of God that He had placed here. The Lord created this earth very good, and He placed man on this earth to be stewards of His creation. Man bore the image of God on earth and represented the communicable attributes of God to all of the world. But Satan's goal was to overthrow God's purpose. He attacked the image bearers of God in an attempt to draw them into rebellion against his cre- their creator. And when Adam and Eve sinned, it cast the entire created order into the curse. And now it's passed on that very nature of sin to all of us who are children of Adam. And this gave way to humanity's greatest problem. Because we are all sinners and because we have all fallen short of the glory of God, we have been separated in relationship from our Creator. We now live in a state of condemnation because of our sin. And we now cannot fulfill the purpose that we are created for was to glorify and magnify Him. But the spiritual enemies of God will not prevail in this world ultimately. Satan will not succeed in destroying the human race and keeping humanity in darkness. He will not succeed in distorting the minds of those who have been created by God. In fact, the victory has already been won. The victory over these spiritual forces of darkness and the victory over our greatest problem, it has already been won. Satan's dominion will not last. Jesus Christ is the victory. And God has established Him as supreme over all things. There is no other way that men may be saved than by the work of God accomplished through Jesus Christ. We see His exaltation above all things through the transformation now that He has brought about within our lives. Those of us who now believe, who have placed our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we have been changed. We are new creations. We are transformed. There is no longer the debt of sin that is bearing upon us because Jesus Christ has taken that debt from us. So we live as those who have been set free. We live as those who have been changed by God. And our very lives bear witness to the testimony of the powerful work of Jesus Christ. And so He is exalted as supreme through those who have come to know Him as Savior and Lord. Through Him He has made us complete. And there is no other means by which man can be saved than through the complete and ultimate work of Jesus Christ. Amen. We must recognize who He is. We must recognize what He has done. We must believe the truth about our problem. We must recognize the truth about our sin. We must understand that apart from Christ, we are condemned. And yet, through the powerful work of God, He sent His Son to pay the penalty for all those who believe. He raised Him from the dead, and He secured for us the pathway to eternal life. And so we exalt Jesus Christ as supreme today. We glorify Him for what He has done in us. As we look at this passage in Colossians chapter 2, we're going to see three ways that God has put the supremacy of Christ 
on display in our transformation. Three ways that God has put the supremacy of Christ on display in our transformation. First, He made us alive. He made us alive. Second, He canceled our debt. He canceled our debt. And third, He overcame our enemies. He overcame our enemies. Three ways that God has put the supremacy of Christ on display in our transformation. Colossians chapter 2. I'm actually going to begin reading in verse 9. We'll read through to verse 15. But we'll only look specifically at verses 13 through 15 this morning. In verse 9 it says, For in Him all the fullness of deity Deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority, and in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead, in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us which was hostile to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And when He had disarmed the rulers and authorities, He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to You this morning glorifying You, honoring You for this work that You have done, this work of transformative power put on display in us, this work that testifies to the fact that You are supreme, You are lifted up above all things, and our lives give You glory for that. We praise You this morning for that completed work that we can never do in our own power. We can never bring ourselves out of spiritual debt. We can never pay the, the debt that we owe to You. And yet, Lord, You have raised us, You have paid our debt, and You have conquered our foes, foes that would seem insurmountable to us, foes that led us in spiritual darkness and deception prior to coming to You. And yet you have opened our minds to what is true. And we recognize that in Jesus Christ is all spiritual wisdom and knowledge. Lord, we place our faith in you alone this morning. We rest from our work of trying to make ourselves righteous. And we understand that you have made us righteous. That is an alien righteousness. Your perfect life. Transferred. For hours. Thank you, Lord, for paying our debt. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. So this first transformative way that we exalt the supremacy of Christ, He made us alive. Verse 13. It says, In you being dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive with Him. This is the great problem that all humanity faces. This is the problem that began with the sin of Adam and Eve and has been passed down to every single person who is born under Adam now to our day. This is the same truth for us as well, that all of us, every single one of us, are born with a sin nature. We are born with a propensity to sin. We are oriented towards self. And we are dead. In our transgressions. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 establishes this spiritual condition with complete clarity. Paul says there, And you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience 
among whom we all also formally conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. This is the truth for all of us. This is what we were born into. To be spiritually dead means that we are following the course of this world. It means that we are living according to the desires of our fallen flesh. It means that we are by our very nature transgressors. Transgressors. We have transgressed God's standard. We have sinned against Him. We have missed the mark of holiness, and we have fallen short of righteousness, and this is true of everyone. None of us are born neutral. None of us are born good. We don't start out with a blank slate. We start out with the nature of sin. And from the time that we begin to choose our own pathway, we choose rebellion against God. This is true of all of us. As we established last week, we are spiritually uncircumcised. We are not in a covenant relationship with God. We are dead and incapable of bringing ourselves back to life. We are stiff-necked and rebellious people who exalt ourselves in pride against God and His Word. And even those who seem good outwardly, those who seem very religious externally, those who seek to order their lives after righteous standards on the outside, they are still spiritually dead on the inside. And the ultimate motivation behind everything that they're doing is not for the ultimate glory of God, but it is for the glory of self. It is self-exaltation in religious practice. It is self-gratification according to the desires of their own prideful hearts. Everyone is born into spiritual death. Just as Ezekiel 36, 26-27 compares our spiritually dead state with having a heart of stone. We have hearts that are made of stone. They are not alive to God. They're not alive to we will not seek for God. We will not seek to honor God. We will not seek to glorify God on His terms. We will not truly act with pure and undefiled hearts because ultimately our dead hearts desire to act for self-interest. We are oriented toward self. Toward self. Prior to salvation, every single person worships themselves over God. Every person. The most religious person that you can think of and the most wicked, rebellious person that you can think of if they are spiritually dead, if they have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, then they are glorifying self. When we're dead in our trespasses and sins, we'll find idols for ourselves to worship We'll look to every other source for fulfillment, possessions, careers, leisure activity, sexual relationships, children, societal acceptance. Anything we can find to serve so that we feel better about ourselves and find some source of meaning in this life where we can still continue to exalt ourselves. All of this ultimately is an expression of self-worship. Every single person, apart from Christ, exalting themselves and the spiritually dead. This is our great problem. And so because of our sin, because of our iniquity, because we have failed to meet the mark of righteousness, that is perfect righteousness, you see, in order to be good enough to enter into God's good graces, we must perfectly obey the law of God from the time that we're born to the time that we're dead, not just externally, but internally within the very thoughts of our hearts. That's the only way you could work your way into God's good graces, and there's not a person on this earth who is capable of doing that. Every single one of us have missed the mark. 
Every single one of us have fallen short. Every single one of us have hearts that are driven towards self. And so for every single one of us, there remains a just condemnation. We are spiritually dead. We cannot bring ourselves back to life. But here's the good news. He made us alive. Amen. He made us alive. Amen. We did not make ourselves alive. A corpse cannot bring itself back from the dead. A dead person cannot stand up and walk under their own power. Something must happen. A work must be done. Regeneration must be brought about. New life must be applied. And this is exactly what God has done for us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has provided us a means of being brought into spiritual life. God has made us alive. Glory. This is all according to His work. All according to His grace. All according to His power. Not according to us. Not according to our power. Not according to our ability. Not according to anything that we have done. We do not bring ourselves out of the grave. It is God who brings us out of the grave. And He brings us to life according to His gracious will and mercy. He has mercy on us. And so just as the power of God brought Jesus Christ, who is eternally God, out of the grave, so that same power transforms us within our hearts and makes us new in Him. This is spiritual resurrection. And for all of us who are still on this earth and haven't received our perfect bodies in eternity yet, although we still live with these bodies of flesh, although we still feel the ailments of the curse, although we still battle sin within our own lives, we have been made spiritually new. We are living in spiritual life. We've been set free. And so now that... We have been set free. It is through the forgiveness of our sins that we live freely. You see, we couldn't pay the penalty for our sin, and so Jesus Christ paid it all. Our transgressions have been forgiven us. And so through forgiveness, we've been brought into spiritual life. And now this transformed life that we live, this transformation of our hearts from stony, dead hearts into living, beating hearts that now are oriented towards Christ, this transformed life now serves as a testimony to the supremacy of Jesus Christ. That's why the gospel is a gospel of life change. Because it is our very lives that proclaim that Jesus Christ is, exalt, is exalted as supreme. There's no such thing as a person who has been saved, who remains dead in their sins. There's no such thing as a Christian who remains spiritually dead and enslaved to the lusts of their flesh. There's no such thing. There are many who claim to be. But if transformation has not occurred in their heart, if they've not been raised from spiritual death into spiritual life, they're not a true believer. The work of God has never happened within their heart. And so the question is, are you now spiritually alive? Are you spiritually alive? Are you living in the light of forgiveness? Are you set free from the bondage of sin upon your life? From the bondage of lust, immorality, greed, worldliness, pride, anger, self-fulfillment? Are you living according to these lusts, controlled by these lusts, or have you been set free from them? Are you now living a life of obedience to Christ through spiritual renewal according to the forgiveness of your sins? Have you been raised with Christ? Is this a spiritual reality for you? 
all those who have truly been raised understand what has occurred to them. They understand the work of God within them. And they understand that there was nothing that they could do to bring about salvation for themselves. It's all the work of God. And so as this new life, as being made alive in Him, glorifies Jesus Christ as supreme, as God has done this work, glorifying Christ as the one who is lifted up above all things, He has made us alive, but He has also canceled our debt. Amen. The second way that spiritual transformation exalts Jesus Christ as supreme, He canceled our debt. Verse 14, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. As those who were spiritually dead and living in sin, our iniquity had built up a debt against us. There is something that we owed. And this is true of every single person. Every person born under the sin of Adam, every person born with a sin nature, every person who cannot live the perfect life inwardly and outwardly from the beginning of their life to the end, every single person has a debt to pay. The payment that we all must pay is according to our works. And because of our spiritual state of death, because of the sins and rebellions that we're all born into, we have transgressed God's righteous standard in our works, in our actions, in our thoughts, everything. It's all been tainted by selfish pride, and it is all known to God. He is all knowing. He is all knowing. He knows every action of sin, He knows every thought of sin, He knows every sinful desire. He knows every temptation that comes from within our hearts. He knows the reasons why we do what we do. He knows why we're striving for external morality if it's striving for our own glory. He knows if we're striving in works-based righteousness, trusting in ourselves. He knows. He knows all of it. Every single ounce of it. And He is a righteous and just judge. What that means is that He will judge all sin perfectly. He will not overlook any sin. It will all be judged. And for all those who are trusting in themselves, for all those who are living according to their own works, for all those who are rejecting this truth about who Jesus Christ is and what He has done and rejecting this understanding that they are a sinner and they do deserve condemnation, if you reject that, you will stand before this God one day. And He will judge all things perfectly. He will judge every thought, every intention, every action that doesn't perfectly align with His righteous standard. And if you're trusting in yourself, you will be found lacking and you will be cast into an eternal hell. Because that's how severe our sin is. We may have a hard time understanding that. But at the root of all of our sin is that a created thing would rise up against its Creator. And instead of worshiping the Creator, would worship itself. That's at the heart of all our sin. And that's why it's so serious that it deserves an eternal punishment. Because we have sinned against an eternal God. That's the reality. That's the debt that we owe. This debt that has been sur surmounting against us, that has been piling up against us from the day that we began to sin, it continues to pile up and pile up and pile up. And all of it is written down. And all of it is placed upon this decree against us. 
a decree that is hostile to us. And according to this decree, we will have to pay it. In Romans 1, chapter 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. You can't repay God for the sins that you've committed. You can't do it. You can't do enough good to outweigh the wrong that you have done. You can't trust in your own morality when you stand before God. Because as elsewhere in Romans says in chapter 3, verse 10, there is none that is righteous. There is not even if we stand before God and we say, but I did this, then we will have to pay the debt. And when you stand before Him, He will require payment. There will be no intermediate time where you get to pay anything off. You will have to pay it then. And that payment will be made with your life. And it will be for all eternity. The second death is reserved for all those who trust in their own ability to be good, who trust in their own understanding, who trust in their own works, who trust in their own morality. But the payment for sin is death, and the second death is eternity in the lake of fire. These decrees that have been built up against us, they are hostile to us, bringing condemnation against us for the sinful works that we do. And this is something that the spiritual forces of darkness love to bring against humanity. Look at how your creation has rebelled against you. Now they must pay. Satan revels in this. But notice who we go back to. Once again, in light of our debt, in light of the debt that we must pay, but God has canceled out the certificate of debt. That is the gospel. God has canceled the certificate of debt. He has canceled all of our debt, everything that we must repay, everything that we must give back for our sin. He's canceled it all. He's wiped it clean. It's not simply been paid partially. It's not been paid after you've done all you can do. It's been completely paid for in full. It's not simply been paid up to this point and you must keep it. No, it's all been paid. Every ounce of debt that was ever written in the decrees against you, every sinful desire, every sinful thought, every sinful action, everything that must be required of you from a righteous God, it's all been paid from the beginning of your life to the end of your life. It is canceled out. It is done. It's complete. It says in verse, verse 14 that God has taken it out of the way. That means that He's obliterated it. Our debt is completely eradicated. And that means for us there is no longer any guilt. There's no longer any guilt. It's done. It's done. It's made complete. The means by which your sin debt, sin debt has been eradicated is through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus' death was not just an example of something. It was that. But it was so much more. Jesus' death was an atoning death. It was a death that satisfied the wrath of God for all the sin committed by all those who belong to Him. 
It says that God took this certificate of debt that you owed because of your sin and He nailed it to the cross. Putting the payment of your sin on public display for all the universe to see all of the sin that you've committed, this decree against you that lists everything that you've ever done, that lists all the payment that you must pay. It is paid for in Christ. It is paid for in full. And that decree is nailed to the cross. And it stays there because Jesus Christ is no longer on that cross. He paid the debt on the cross. He made a public display of it. And then He left and was raised again. And now for us, the cross stands as the symbol of our debt being paid. Roman Catholicism exalts a crucifix with Jesus still on it. But He's no longer there. He died and He was buried. And He rose again on the third day. And the only thing left on the cross is the complete payment for your sin. Mormonism takes offense at the cross because they don't understand that for true believers, those who place their faith in Christ, the cross is not an offense, but rather it is the public display of our sins being completely paid for. Those who trust in works-based religions cannot comprehend the cross because they cannot comprehend that there's nothing left for us to do, that Christ did it all on the cross, and it is completely paid for there. In the cross, the wrath of God is satisfied. And so, the cross serves to put on display God's victory over condemnation. It is the supremacy of Christ publicly displayed by setting the captives of the dominion of darkness free. And now it is as if that cross still stands on Golgotha. And if you were to go there and you were to look to it, what would still be nailed to that cross if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation would be those decrees against you paid in full. Still there. For all eternity. It's all done. It's all been erased. Christ has completed the work. So that means for us, there is nothing left to do but trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Do you believe this? Have you placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ? If you have, your debt is paid. It's paid in full. And as He did all of this, As God has made us alive, as He has canceled our debt, He has also overcome our enemies. This third means of spiritual transformation exalts the supremacy of Christ. He overcame our enemies. Verse 15. Having disarmed the rulers and authorities... He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them. We've been introduced to these rulers and authorities already back in chapter 1, verse 16. We saw there how these are spiritual authorities. These are spiritual rulers of darkness. These are those who are according to the prince of the power of the air working in the sons of disobedience. This is Satan and his workers, spiritual authorities, spiritual powers. Those who in the very beginning set to distort God's created order, set to lead astray all of God's created people, those who brought deception into this world, and that very one 
Satan. He sought to overthrow God's purposes. He is the devil. The slanderer. The one who brings accusations against God's elect. The one who seeks to bring deception against all those who are image bearers of God. He is the one who from the very beginning has been working against humanity so as to rebel against God Himself. He is the great power in our earth that leads all those who don't belong to God in total deception, according to lies, driven by their own fleshly desires. He establishes false religion. He establishes means by which men can exalt themselves in their own works-based righteousness, and it seems as though He is winning. But the reality is this. Christ has crushed the head of the serpent. Amen. The victory has already been declared. When Christ died on the cross, He claimed victory for Himself. And although there is still a time in which He is allowing Satan and his workers of darkness to continue to work within this world according to their deceptive practices, Satan is still walking about to and fro, looking for someone to devour. He walks as one who has lost the war. He walks as one who has been condemned. And he walks as one who Christ has claimed victory over. And so for all those who have been set free in Christ, we have been set free from enslavement to deception from Satan. He no longer leads us. We are led according to the power of the Spirit of God. Jesus Christ has disarmed these rulers and authorities. This phrase, having disarmed them, it means to completely strip bare. It would have been what a conquering army would have done to their prisoners, stripping them of every weapon, every ounce of armor, every tool, any medals and crowns of dignity, all of it stripped from them so that they are now powerless. This is what Christ has done to the armies of darkness. It says He has triumphed over them. This is to lead those who are conquered as prisoners in a triumphant procession. It is to drag the ca captured ones through the streets in chains so that everyone can see who the victor is. This is what he has done. We've seen another glimpse of this already if you were with us through 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. Remember there, that passage, it deals with the, even the pre-flood world and how these spiritual forces of darkness came and they attempted to lead the pre-flood world astray and they attempted to bring about this plan that would, that would even seek to cut off humanity from the promised seed. And they led humanity in total rebellion against God. And they were punished along with the entire world. It says there in 1 Peter 2, verses 18 and 19, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that He might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And then this is what He did in which also He went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. That is those pre-flood demons who sought to overcome the plan of God from the very beginning. He has taken them and He cast them into spiritual darkness, chained them in the abyss, and when He conquered death on the cross and was raised again, He went to that place where they are chained away and He proclaimed victory to them. He proclaimed that He has won. That He has overcome them. 
and that now they all await a day of final judgment. Every effort of the enemy to thwart God's plans has been abolished in Christ. Satan will not have the final say over this creation. He will not have the final say over the image bearers of God. Our enemy has been defeated. And so Christ's exaltation serves to put on display God's victory over the spiritual forces of darkness. He's won. It's done. It's finished. And even as they continue to lead those who don't belong to Christ in this world according to deception, even as false religion continues to envelop this world, even as there are constant lies, constant deception, constant falsehood, constant rebellion that is leading all of this world astray, and even as Satan has dominion over those who do not belong to Christ, Christ has exalted Himself above Satan. And God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and He has placed us in the kingdom of His beloved Son. So we are now protected from them. Protected from deception. Protected from Satan's leading. We now have been shown the only source of of true spiritual knowledge and wisdom. And that is in Jesus Christ. So what do we now do? We return daily to the one who has claimed victory over deception. We return daily to the one who has paid our debt for us. We return daily to the one who has made us alive This miraculous work of spiritual renewal is entirely a work of God. It has been completed for all of us who place our faith in Him, and it is only accomplished through the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is why all of the deception, every bit of it out there in this world today, would seek to change our understanding person and work of Jesus Christ. And there is a variety of ways in which this is done. Some would seek to come to us totally casting out the understanding that there is a God and that Jesus was divinity. Some would seek to come to us claiming to follow Jesus and to be a church of Jesus Christ and yet twisting who he actually is, distorting how he is defined, and contorting what he has done. But Jesus Christ is the eternal God. He always has been, and he always will be. He is one with the Father and with the Spirit. One God, three persons, existing for all time. No other gods. No other ability to become God. And Jesus Christ, being God, has paid the penalty for the sin of all those who have placed their faith in Him. This is not according to works. It's not according to anything good that we do. It's not according to our own morality. It's not according to any religious observance that we have. It's not according to any mystical words that we say. It's according to His finished work. And so we rest, we place our faith in Him for who He is and what He has done. We believe it, we trust in it, and we return to it daily. And as we return to the source of truth, we are established in Him against all the lies that would come against us. And this is the gospel that we're now called to proclaim. Unashamedly, unashamedly, we don't consider other options as as if they're plausible because they are all set in rebellion against God's truth and they're all devised by Satan to lead the world astray. And so we stand upon this 
firm foundation of truth in Jesus Christ. We are made complete in Him. Let us rest in that today. And let us proclaim this completed work to all those that we come in contact with. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to You this morning resting in Your work. I thank you, Lord, that you have transformed us from spiritual death into spiritual life. I thank you that you have made us new creations, that you have set us free from enslavement to sin, that you have given us the ability to now live according to the truth of your word with desires that are reoriented towards you. I thank you, Lord, for canceling the debt that we owed that we could likewise never pay. You paid our debt in full on the cross and You have provided us the forgiveness that we needed. We are desperate for You. And Lord, You have overcome our enemies. These enemies against us, these enemies against You, these spiritual forces of darkness who have been in rebellion against You from the beginning of Your created order. You have conquered them. You have declared victory over them. And we trust that You are going to complete that victory one day in the future. And they will all be cast into eternal condemnation. But Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning who doesn't understand this truth. I pray for anyone here this morning who is continuing to strive according to their own power, who is continuing to strive according to their own understanding, who has been deceived, who doesn't understand your gospel, who doesn't accept the fact that they are a sinner and deserving of condemnation. I pray for all those who may be here who do not know you. And Lord, I ask you, recognizing that you are the power of salvation, you would work powerfully in their heart today. I pray, Lord, that you would save the lost today. That you would bring them into your kingdom. That you would transform their heart. That you would pay their debt in full. And that you would set them free from their enemy, the one who would deceive them and bring them into truth. Grant them faith in what is true this morning. And for us who believe, Lord, daily return us to this truth and empower us to proclaim it with boldness. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.